Welcome to this episode of Season 4 of The Common Bridge, where policy and current events are discussed in a fiercely nonpartisan manner. The host, Richard Helpy, is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and political analyst who has reached over 3.5 million listeners, viewers, and readers around the world. The Common Bridge is available on the Substack website and the Substack app. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can find the program on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. The Common Bridge draws guests and audiences from across the political spectrum, and we invite you to become a free or paid subscriber on your favorite medium. Hello, welcome to The Common Bridge. You know, we often say on The Common Bridge when you hear about a group of people, well, how many people do you know like that? Well, guess what? I kept hearing about Georgia voters this and Georgia voters that. And I said, well, you know, I know some Georgia voters. And here today, not representing all Georgia voters or all Atlanta voters, but an engaged man from Atlanta, Georgia, Thomas Hicks. Thomas, welcome to the Common Bridge. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Rich. I appreciate the opportunity to come on and um, share my views with you and your audiences. Right. Well, it's look, it's been a uh, really newsy period over the last several years in Georgia. Um, and in recent weeks, of course, we've had the uh, mugshot of the former president. Um, he's you know claimed that he's shot a 67 to win the club tournament. Uh, he claims he was six foot three, weighed 215 pounds, which compares favorably, by the way, to Muhammad Ali, who was six three, two thirty six. Yeah. Um, but I think the best quote I heard this week was Stormy Daniels saying, "If he's six three, two fifteen, she's a hundred and ten pounds and a virgin." Um, <laughs> so, That's with that as a background, <laughs> and uh, us here in the belly of the beast uh, in Georgia, uh, as described by our current president, um, as he said, we shouldn't play baseball in your town there. Uh, tell our listeners, our readers, and our viewers a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Uh, what were some of your early days like and what's your career arc been and what are you up to today? Well, thanks, Rich. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, born and raised in Atlanta, uh, educated in the Atlanta public schools. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I decided I wanted to go out into the world. So I didn't go directly to uh, college, but a few years later, went back, earned a Bachelor of Bachelor of Arts degree at Georgia State. Um, communications was my area. I actually had, uh, from my work at the radio station at Georgia State, 88.5 WRAS, I was contacted by the management team at Atlanta's NPR affiliate and worked for a few years as an announcer and producer at the local NPR affiliate. Um, while working my way through school, I was working in healthcare. And that eventually led to my meeting you when I came to Superior back in 1996. Um, so born and raised in Atlanta, I have worked now in healthcare IT for 30 plus years, uh, looking at retirement possibly in the next decade thereabouts. Um, enjoy myself now, uh, mostly traveling. I've seen uh, four continents. I have a bucket list of setting foot on every continent. Folks ask me, well, what will you do when you get to Antarctica? I'll say, say that I've stepped on Antarctica. <laughs> so looking <laughs> forward to for that trip as well. But um, uh, definitely appreciate the opportunity to, you know, share some general thoughts on uh, my view of how uh, politics is playing out across the country and specifically how it's playing out here in Georgia. So I appreciate Great. this well, uh, opportunity. Yeah. Uh, do you do you vote and have you voted regularly since you were eligible to vote when you turned I have, of the I age? I think when I became of legal age, I have voted in every uh, local election uh, for mayors, uh, for governors, uh, uh, folks going to Congress, and quite obviously every presidential contest. So yes, I am uh, uh, always uh, willing and determined to let my voice be heard. How, how do you cast your ballot? Are you a in-person, mail-in, uh, absentee? How do you cast your ballot? I have traditionally always cast my ballot in person. Even in the last presidential contest, when uh, COVID was still a concern, 
Um, but you know, took safety measures and uh, cast my 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 ballot in person. That's been the standard for me. Uh, that has been the standard for me. Uh, I will probably always uh, cast the ballot in person. I think you and I have had one brief dialogue, um, and I think it was an area where we were in agreement with all that can be done online. In my way of thinking, there has to be a very secure means of allowing people to cast their ballots online. It'd be I, I, I cannot see any reason why I should not be able to cast a ballot from my laptop at home. Yeah. Look, we can track uh, lottery numbers, lottery registrations um, with great precision, know where the person's located when they're ca- when they're buying that ticket. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, we can do it. The technology's there and it could all be counted. And, you know, we do it on a Sunday afternoon and we'd know before Monday morning came with great Absolutely. precision yep. how the vote turned out. Yep. Um, so, how, you know, under the current... Uh, situation. How do you feel about the integrity of the voting process in Georgia today? I never had any reservations about the integrity of the process. Um, I'm of the firm opinion that the folks who question the integrity did so for obvious reasons. Uh, the Trump campaign after the uh, presidential contest um, asked for a recount it was done. There was a there was a machine recount and a hand recount, and I don't have any um, issues with uh, with what those findings were from the initial voting of ballots to the electronic recount to the hand recount. Uh, I don't have any reservations about the integrity. Okay, great. Well, um, you know, and it, it wasn't like uh, Trump threw the first punch uh, either. Um, you know, of course, Stacey Abrams in 2018, claimed that she had won the governor uh, election, uh, continued to say that. Uh, She said the election was stolen. Uh, She told the New York Times that she won. She said the election laws were rigged, was not a free and fair election. And while she acknowledged that Brian Kemp was the governor, she refused to say he was legitimate. And uh, she claimed that uh, the election was stolen from the people of Georgia. Um, And that and and I, I like to to highlight that not to debate Stacey Abrams, but it, it kind of sours the mood, if you will, that uh, we've had close elections. We've had, you know, the 1960 presidential election, um, you know, the, the 2000 presidential election. I mean, you know, these things happen close. What we haven't had is the amount of contesting. Um, mm-hmm. But in your voting, have you ever felt that you were blocked or intimidated or any way anybody trying to prevent you from casting a vote? I've not felt that I was personally targeted or that anyone uh, tried to deliberately prohibit me from voting. Um, I recall actually during the last mm-hmm. presidential contest, the polling place that I went to and very long lines that were moving extremely slowly. And there were reports that other polling places in my county had fewer people and lines that were moving very quickly. And so it sort of, uh, I suppose it may call into question, well, why is a given area where the voting base is largely black having extremely long wait times versus not so long await at uh, a place where the the voting base is predominantly white. That was the that was a sort of discussion I heard while I stood in line that day. Uh, wanted to circle back to Stacey Abrams. Um, she called into question, and I believe she had a legitimate reason for doing so, when running against Brian Kemp in two thousand uh, twenty eighteen. He was running for governor while serving as secretary of state, essentially overseeing the election. And I don't know if there is any opportunity or scenario where 
it, it might appear to be justified to stand back or step away from your position as Secretary of State when you're in the actual contest, uh, that looked like a good opportunity to have done so, and he, he did not. The only other thing I'll offer, not so much as a defense. Yeah, the, uh, the, the optics, yeah. the op- yeah, hey, listen, the optics on that would be horrible, right? Yeah, they were. Um, and the and, only uh, other thing I'll say relative to Stacey, um, she did refuse to concede, but in her defense, I won't use the term defense, I will say um, to add some weight to uh, maybe her credibility, she did not take steps to try to uh, illegally overturn the election. You know, she said she 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 felt some of the reasons that he was in office, um, the fact that he was a secretary of state while in the same contest, uh, I think raised some eyebrows. Like you said, the, the optics were not good, uh, but she never Ab- sought Ab- never absolutely. sought to overthrow the election or overturn. Yeah, I hope nobody thinks about it again. Just for the record, yeah. <laughs> okay, we're. <laughs> We're, we're, we're in, a, in some dangerous territory um, right here. Um, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but, it, you know, uh, there's a woman in um, Georgia, in Atlanta, um, Misha Maynard, uh, representing the House District 56 in the Georgia legislature, um, a strong Democratic swath of Atlanta, um, that she was elected as a Democrat, went to the voters and said, I'm a Democrat and was elected and after the election switched over to the Republicans around an issue about school vouchers. Um, That's really all I've heard about it. Is there any chatter discussion about that in your neck of the woods? I'm on the east side of town, so I'm not in the city of Atlanta. I'm actually in Cobb County in Mableton. Um, I'm not familiar with her name. I think you mentioned her briefly in a a recent a uh, brief conversation that you and I had, but I've not heard her name. I've not seen it in the print media here, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, uh, nor have I seen it in local news. Uh, and I'll be brutally honest, um, I tend to consume more national news than local. Here lately, I've been doing mostly local news just to get the forecasts. Uh, we're in the midst of quite a brutal heat wave. But uh, I'm not familiar with her name. I, she has not come up in the... Uh, any of the news media that that I've uh, been perusing. Yeah, it's it's odd that it's it's a quiet story, but again, it's a state legislature, so it probably wouldn't have any national legs. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys have had a couple of doozies on the Senate. Um, both senators, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff, uh, mm-hmm. if I'm hoping I'm pronouncing his name correctly, um, they won by runoffs, and then a. Um, <laughs> I just ha- I'll just ask th- this: uh, Raphael Warnock and um, Herschel Walker. How would you feel as a Georgian and Atlanta voter um, with that contest? And as close as it was to, I I could not understand. I will never understand how it was as close as it was. Um, I I will just be brutally honest. I I felt that Herschel Walker had no qualifications for the office he was being proposed to. Um, he had no record of public service. Uh, I, it, it was a clear and present, uh, scenario where folks wanted a person in the Senate seat. They wanted that seat to such an extent that they would send anyone to occupy that seat. Uh, so I, I was personally embarrassed. It was difficult for me to watch the debates that he uh, participated in. It was different, difficult for me to watch um, his press conferences. Uh, that is certainly one contest where I believe the best person won. And I don't ever want to look back at that and have to think about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, again, it was it was really close. And I mean, the uh, uh, I, I think both both of your senators were surprise winners. Mm-hmm. Um, and it probably dragged down, uh, or the, the Republican challengers were dragged down by, uh, the machinations of, of, uh, Donald Trump. Now you p- tend to be a democratic voter, correct? Correct. And Rich, I did want to say one other thing. Um, 
it was one of the few times in my life where I actually agreed with something that Mitch McConnell said. He said, as long as we're putting forth bad candidates, we're going to lose elections. And he was speak. He, he made that um, specifically regarding uh, some of the other Senate contests, but also specifically regarding uh, Herschel Walker. And it was one of the few times I've ever agreed with Mitch McConnell. Yeah, you know, you know, I think you and Mitch and I are going to be in agreement. And uh, today um, we have a situation where three quarters of Americans do not want to see a repeat of Biden and Trump. Yet it looks at the moment and there's a long way to go yet. There's not even been the first caucus, but it looks like that's what we're going to get. And it seems to me that the um, processes need to be looked at. Um, and we're, we're in this um, uh, weird. Have you ever voted for a Republican? I have not. I have I have always traditionally I'll, I'll add a uh, sort of a disclaimer. Traditionally, I have voted for whoever I felt presented ideas and policies that made the most sense. I also have traditionally voted for uh, candidates who I believe were advocates for the working class. Born and raised in Southwest Atlanta, uh, middle class neighborhood. My dad worked and went to school. My mom worked and went to school. I worked and went to school. I just like those candidates who um, propose policy and implement policy that benefit the, the 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 middle class, the working class. And so, generally speaking, that has me traditionally aligning myself with uh, with the Democrats. Yeah, and, and again, I agree with that tradition. Um, you know, we've seen the split in the union vote where the union leadership remains in the Democratic policy. But I'll tell you, a lot of the rank and file are Republicans, and a lot of them are strong Trump supporters. Um, I know when the Trump uh, phenomena was beginning, uh, leading up to the 2016 election, the first people that ever told me that they were in the camp for Trump were UAW workers, Teamsters, police officers. Um, th that was the folks that felt like they didn't have a responsive government. I'm, I'm sure you know the same data I know that the uh, Democrats' fundings tends to come from the coast and from fairly uh, wealthy people. Um, and, and I think that that is a phenomena that uh, that we need to deal with. Like, like who's looking out for, for middle America and who's looking out for uh, the, the less fortunate? And, and mm -hmm. I, I think there's a growing sense that we really don't have anybody at this point. Um, you know, with the amount of lobbyist writing uh, legislation and the amount of PAC money that's in and the dark money that's in, um, we're trying to figure out whose government is it. And I think it's a dangerous time. And dangerous time can lead to dangerous people. Um, and we are going to be talking about um, a guy that I don't think you have much good to say about, but would you, are there any accomplishments uh, that you would point to of Donald Trump's presidency? Good or bad? <laughs> um, no, well, I, you know, good accomplishments. So, that you let, say, let, you know, let me like, like, like let me, here's the things people talk about for what it's worth. Me, I, that, actually, that, I think I know how I want to respond. Okay. And I'll, I'll go back not so much to looking at his legacy or what he left behind coming out of his presidency, but I'll look to what I think possibly or probably led to his presidency. America has a fascination and a preoccupation with celebrity. He was a celebrity. He had been um, on network TV in The Apprentice. Uh, Macy's started carrying a line of ties. I lamentably uh, admit to this, but I at one point owned a Donald Trump tie. Uh, I no longer own it. I, I don't want to have anything associated with him now. I think he ascended to um, that office based largely in part because America is obsessed with celebrity. Um, I also think folks wanted to change they said someone who does not have a background in politics maybe will bring something new and fresh. 
that was disastrous because he had no concept of anything that's in the Constitution. He had no concept of how anything within uh, D.C. politics works. And, and that was abundantly clear. All you had to do was watch from day to day when he tried to enact policy via Twitter. I think so much of his four years in office was disastrous. Uh, at the top of the list for me was uh, the bigotry. Uh, immediately imposing a ban on Muslims, making references to African countries being, I think we know the term he came up with, for African countries. Um, I, I, you can I get say it that on this show because it's my, it, I, think he, I think it was shithole. Yeah, um, that, that, that yeah, was what, I, so, I, By the way, you have great lines to say anything you want on this is my show. You can say anything you want to. Okay, all right. Um, but so in hindsight... Uh, no, I don't really see anything good that he did um, from from my general knowledge of the GOP and ultra conservative culture and the idea that it promotes fiscal responsibility. I hear very few folks in the GOP referencing the fact that uh, the, uh, the the debt sp- sparked or spiked to $8 trillion during his four years in office. So uh, I, I can't say that anyone could say that represents fiscal conservatism. So I think that has pretty much gone out the window. So yeah, I, I, I know, know it was a very I, roundabout I, way of... Uh, yeah, no, it's, I, I think question, it's very but, well, well, look, well thought out. And I, I wrote a uh, column this uh, past week uh, published on uh, August 26th um, where I said that the greatest threat is retos, which is Republicans if Trump only. And um, w- one of those uh, subgroups in there um, are people that just feel disaffected by the, um, by the non-responsive uh, political system, that they said, mm-hmm. we, don't, we got to try something different. Mm-hmm. There's still a group of those. There's, of course, the, what I'll call the disciples, the personality cult folks, um, which is weird because the guy's running on the same stuff that he couldn't do the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the people that are upset about the uh, weaponization of the uh, judiciary. And then there are what, I, what there are Democrats that are crossing over in the primaries to vote for the most extreme candidate that they can. In this case, it would be Trump in order to have an easier time in the general. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of that, by the way, went on in 16. That mm-hmm. there were people that because it was obvious that Hillary Clinton was going to be the Democratic nominee, people crossed over to vote for Trump, fail, figuring like she's going to beat him. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't. I think the Democrats, uh, if I can steal a word from George Bush, misunderestimated <laughs> the uh, uh, antipathy for Hillary Clinton. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were, you know, in my home state of Michigan, uh, Democrats wouldn't vote for her. Uh, mm-hmm. She never went to Wisconsin. Uh, she lost that and. I just don't know enough about Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And so we have this fluke president that didn't know the job, didn't seem to want to know the job, yeah. and had massive personal issues. Yeah. I mean, I try to imagine if I was ever the president of the United States, and on the first day you have this incredibly humbling responsibility, I'm pretty sure my first thought wouldn't be, how big is my inauguration crowd? Absolutely. Okay. It started immediately. It started, it, it, yeah. and, everything that could go wrong started at the very beginning with references yeah. to, to crowd size. So, uh, and, and what I want to say about, about, about this is that the, um, there, there are a couple things I would uh, give Trump credit for. So first of all, the tax reform, um, which at long last capped the deduction on state and local taxes mm-hmm. um, that, uh, we had people like you and people like me in our states subsidizing these high tax states. Um, so putting a cap on that, I thought was good. Um, there were no wars. And what people won't talk about in terms of the spending is that that spending was really COVID response. And, uh, you know, I thought that the response from a policy basis was better than the response to the Great Recession. The Great Recession, of course, there was a lot of money was given to banks, the people that caused the problem, and the poor guy that lost his job through no fault of of their own 
and and had their credit rating destroyed. They got nothing. At least this time, they gave the money to the people. Okay, you know, in COVID relief, and and that's where that spend came from. Um, and and again, that was generally regarded as good spend. Um, mm -hmm. You know, not so much the inflationary uh, act, but but just again, so so Trump identifies a split from from the norms. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's stipulate that, right? Um, and, it, and it was a, it, but also there were some other things that split from the norms. So by way of example, Jerry Nadler, very senior member of Congress on day one said, we're going to impeach this guy. Okay, not we're going to give him a chance. We're going to work with them. We're going to impeach them. Um, we know that Hillary Clinton and the Democrat National Committee funded the Steele reporting. We know that they floated the story about a line between Trump Tower and the bank in Russia. We know that they floated the story about P tapes. We know that information around COVID was suppressed. We know that the situation in Lafayette Square was misreported. We now know that Anthony Fauci was just making stuff up about lockdowns, masks, and the six foot rule. So we've now we've got this dueling sets of lack of integrity. And, and in my humble opinion, that gave a lane for Donald Trump just to lie his ass off and say whatever he wanted to say, because he could always point at the other side and go, well, th these guys said this. So, That's, it you know, was. what did, did you believe? Did you believe? Let me ask you this. Did you of those hoaxes, the P tape, the Russian collusion, the line between, you know, the Trump Tower and uh the bank in Russia. How many of those did you buy into before they were dismissed? Probably not most of them. There was I, I reached uh, a Trump saturation point very early <laughs> on, where it was just more than I wanted to look at or listen to. Uh, I will, <laughs> I will very uh, openly admit. I quite literally don't like the sound of his voice such that when I see him on the television, I change the channel. Uh, I, I hate that he's still sucking up so much oxygen in every room. So uh, much of that just struck me as nonsense. Now, I, I did believe that there needed to be a thorough investigation uh, of the extent to which Russia did or did not interfere in the 2016 election. So I, I I probably lent more credence to that story than any of the other ones that you just referenced. But um, that's, so, that's by the way, so, so did I, and I, so did I, and I'm well published. I'm mm -hmm. like, get to the bottom of it mm -hmm. and bring us the facts. Yeah. And it turned out to be a dead. One other thing, Rich, that comes to mind, I'm not sure if this is uh, on a list of potential things that you may have jotted down for us to touch base on. But one of the other areas where you and I have um, split or uh, I say, uh, perhaps looked in slightly different directions um, is where the media is. I won't say the role of the media, but more specifically, what media can and should be trusted. I was a communications major, so one thing that's abundantly clear to me, I think probably as to most uh, reasonably prudent citizens, is that ratings drive revenue, and so cable news, network news is going to do whatever they can to drive their ratings to build up their revenue. I can accept that. But you and I have split over some other media outlets that are not even for profit, some not for profit outlets such as the AP, Reuters, NPR. I recall in one of our discussions, you said NPR has lost its way. And I said, well, this is certainly going to be one of those instances where it's going to be very difficult to, for us to come to terms or to come to an agreement. I, I don't think all media can be, um, trying to think of the best word. You can't assail all media. There's, there has to be somewhere, a middle of the road, where some facts make it in. And in those instances, in these not-for-profits, the AP, NPR, 
uh, Reuters, there's some others that come to mind, BBC. Uh, they're not ratings driven. They are gathering and disseminating information for folks like me who work nine and a half, 10 hours a day. And at the end of the day, want to have some idea of what happened. And so I think that was one area, um, politics aside, where we did not come to an agreement. And that's and, and where, the look, media, I, I, where the media, yeah, where the media is. Look, I appreciate that, that uh, measured response. And um, I've had a number of journalists on my program, and I've read uh, many books on this. And it's not like somebody at NPR or the AP um, sets out to falsify a story. Mm -hmm. um, but they're human beings. It's not like it, it's they decide they're going to leave out this fact or that fact. And mm -hmm. kind of my proof statement is this. If I said to you, uh, there's an NPR story about Joe Biden, do you think it's going to be a positive or a negative story? If there's a Fox News story about Donald Trump, <laughs> what do you think you're going to get? And yes. you could go down the line and they all have their techniques. Um, mm -hmm. The New York Times, by the way, is really adept. Their, their two favorite techniques are they leave out a key fact and then they put the actual other argument like 40 paragraphs down. All right. That changes their whole narrative. Mm -hmm. That's how they're doing that to your point, because they need the clicks and the eyeballs and the reactions and the reposts and mm -hmm. such. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very difficult to get a, a full picture in today's media model. And we've had, again, experts that are um, well credentialed, that, are, that are continue to work as journalists, um, explaining th why that's occurred. And, and it kind of brings us back to Trump, too, because all the airtime Trump's been getting lately about these trials, every one of those news outlets needs the guy. Like, if they weren't talking about Trump, what would they be talking what about? What would they be talking about? I, I mean, you know, them. you just said you're in, you're in the middle of a historic heat wave. Yeah. Seems kind of important to me. Absolutely. Um, Maui, a place that's very dear to me, the Lahaina, Lahaina town, mm -hmm. being wiped out is a big deal. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, there's a lot of things going on in the world that are being pushed to the side. Mm -hmm. So... Now we've got these four trials going on, okay? Um, so let's just start with New York, okay? The core here is that Trump paid off a porn star. Is it? Do you, would, would you be surprised if, if it was brought to light that Donald Trump paid off a porn star? Not at all. I, 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 I would probably okay. venture to think that he's Me probably paid off many porn stars. <laughs> <laughs> any that would have anything to do with him anyway yeah i wouldn't all right exactly i mean i i wouldn't have uh, i i like to me it's like yeah I, the Who guy's cares? a slime bag he's a he's a slime bag yeah okay he's a, not a good person mm -hmm. and yeah so like that doesn't surprise me um but you know, let me let me say this that you know New York has invented 34 counts of falsifying records for one act, one act of paying off a porn star, and they uh, it's it may not even be illegal because it has to be tied to a, a felony, which prosecutor Bragg hasn't even said what the felony is. Mm -hmm. Yet now you have people with the sound bite, there's 91 counts against Trump. Yeah, 34 of them, are, it's like, here's the check, that's one count, here's the entry in the accounting books, here's another one. Mm -hmm. Oh, the check cash, that's a third one, police. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, all the crap this guy's being accused of, and, and you're just, it just makes him sympathetic. And he, and he fundraises off of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I've read that uh, since the mugshot was released, <laughs> Thursday, that he's raised seven million dollars from uh, proceeds from the mugshot. So <laughs> yeah. uh, it's we're in a very yeah, strange yeah. place. And, and yeah, it's it's yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That doesn't even begin to describe it. Like, oh, another indictment. 
good. Yeah. It's like not yeah. good. No. Yeah. Not. But but it's a, it's again that what I call one of those categories of the retos, the Republicans mm-hmm. of Trump only. Mm-hmm. There is a content a, a, a uh, constituency that says I think the Justice Department and the judiciary is being perverted, and I'm voting against that. And that's horrible because I don't want to see Donald Trump back in the Oval Office. Okay, mm-hmm. Florida, the Mar-a-Lago case. Um, a you know this, the claim is that Trump hid documents, wouldn't give him back. Um, his own ex Attorney General Bill Barr says he's probably in trouble for this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm old enough to remember when all this dispute began in the Nixon administration. Mm-hmm. Okay, and there was a fight about what belonged to the president and what belonged to the United States. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the Presidential Records Act came into being in 1978, signed by President Jimmy Carter. God bless the man as he's in hospice. Do mm-hmm. um, you know the first person that had issue with the Presidential Records Act? I am Jimmy going, Carter. Okay, really? didn't know that. <laughs> and so every president has this is unsettled mm-hmm. like this. And now we find, well, hey, Biden had documents and he wasn't even the president and so did Pence and he wasn't the president. Um, So they're going to try this Espionage Act thing. And I'm thinking, really, if this guy's this bad and and that's your best case. And so here's the problem. It's kind of like the the parable of the boy that cried wolf. Mm -hmm. Okay, You, you tell me enough times from a P tape to hiding documents and it all turns out to be bullshit, it makes me less willing to believe the next thing. How's it affecting you as a, you know, politically engaged, you know, Democrat leaning guy in a very important part of the country? How's all that, you know, running up to the football and there's no football there? How's that hitting you? The case with the classified documents, as I see it, is much more significant. Uh, it's much it's much weightier than uh, New York and paying the the porn star. Joe Biden had classified documents. When it came to his attention, he turned them in. Mike Pence had classified documents. When it came to his attention, he turned those documents over. I think they they all turned them over to NARA. When it was identified that Trump had classified documents, he didn't turn them over. He hid them. He took steps to ensure that um, when the boxes were being moved to be hidden, that footage of the moving of the boxes was to be destroyed. Everything about it is just nefarious. He kept what he was not supposed to have. The U.S. government asked for it back. He refused to give it, took steps to cover up his attempts to hide it. it and we don't know what the classified documents are. We don't know how uh, sensitive the materials are. Uh, nuclear secrets, who knows? So it it just, to me, looks a lot weightier than what we saw in New York. Yeah, look, I think that's a, a good point. Um, you know, the Biden and Pence shouldn't have had him in the first place. And yeah. how do we know that they actually gave them all back? We don't, we don't, we don't know. There's no way of knowing because it was never told exactly what they had. Um, they I think had we him could, in the first place. We could but possibly there, look there, to There's the also age. issues with. I was going to say we could possibly look but, to And all narrow. these allegations about Trump, that'll come out at trial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but what I want to say is this, all the allegations about things got moved or whatever, or, you know, it was just his bathroom reading. I don't know. But um, for a guy the, who never read, <laughs> I, I think that he'll get convicted. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Very good. I like that. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, Lots of reading the, uh, material for a guy who the, never read. Yeah. The, uh, right, I mean, yeah his, well, that's his cabinet had to. Um, I'm told that everything had to be put in bullet points for him to consume the daily briefings. This guy reads nothing, and it's abundantly yeah, yeah, clear. Exactly that, to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, like I said, he doesn't didn't know the job, didn't want to learn the job. Yeah. 
yep. and and massive personal problems. So I my sense is that this moving around stuff, if it proves to be true, mm -hmm. um, that it's I, I, it looks to me more like more of his wackadoodle personality. Mm -hmm. um, but my guess is he's going to get convicted on an obstruction charge. It's pretty low. Obstruction's a pretty low bar, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, I, I guarantee you, Thomas, if you or I got charged with a thing, mm -hmm. um, we're going to get hit with obstruction, too, by mm -hmm. asking, like, what do you I mean, it's it's such a low bar. And I think they're going to get him um, with that. And I do want to get to Georgia, but I want to clear these other things here. Cool. Um, we now have the January 6th uh, uh, things being filed in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. um, my preface to this, I thought the president's behavior uh was abhorrent. Mm -hmm. uh, I was listening to it in real time. Uh, I was in California when he was talking about Mike Pence needs to do the right thing, which meant violate the Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mike Pence, thank goodness, uh, stood tall and the Constitution was protected and the election uh, proceeded. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought President Trump pouting like a big baby and not welcoming the incoming president at the White House. Absolutely. Um, it was a very low point in our history. Um, but do you, so, but I, but I, but I look at what the media reports that he did and what the charges were. And I'm like, huh, why there's nothing about a coup, nothing about an armed insurrection. Have you read the, the charges in Washington, just by the way? I have not. But okay, no, well, and, let me tell you what you perceived. Uh, yeah, but, let me tell you but, what there's four things. I want okay. to get to Georgia, so I'm going to try to go through this quick. Four okay. things in Washington conspiracy to violate civil rights, conspiracy to defraud the government, corrupt obstruction of an official proceeding, and conspiracy to carry out such obstruction. Okay, mm -hmm. which you know sounds like you know pretty good, uh, that they're on a pretty good basis there, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on those things, and as the left-wing media pundit said, it doesn't really matter. He has to face a Washington, D.C. jury, um, which lets you question the even-handedness. Um, but I don't know very many people, in fact, I don't know anybody personally, that thought what occurred on the 6th of January uh, 2021 was a good thing. I, I wouldn't imagine you know anybody either. I, I don't. Uh, it, I watched it in real time. I was working from home. Uh, the TV was on, and in looking up, I saw what I usually term a siege taking place at the Capitol. Um, and, and in the days that followed, learned uh, more about how it was coordinated. I'll just use that term. Uh, it has to be prosecuted such that it doesn't happen again. Uh, and I will not try to ever get into the head of a prosecutor. You know, I, I work in IT. Uh, the law is not my area of specialty. But I, I say the charges that were brought, uh, there has to be, or I'm of the impression that there was a strategy for bringing those charges. And I will see how the trial plays out. Yeah, I, I um, by the way, I, I, at the time of that happened, I said this needs to be investigated and um, needs to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Mm -hmm. um, I just cringe because I thought the charges were pretty weak, mm -hmm. and all it does is add fuel mm -hmm. um, to the the Trump. You know, again, it's that that pro that part of the electorate that says it looks like the um, the judicial systems being weaponized. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have everything that's going on with, with the Bidens. I'm not going to get into that today. We, you know, maybe we have you back to chat about that at some point. But let's Good. get into Georgia. This is, you know, your home area. Um, and I know this has got to be a difficult time. Um, have, have you looked into the charges at what Mr. Trump's being charged with? At the simplest level, so to answer your question, no, I've not read the details. I've not read the full indictment. Uh, at the simplest level, conspiracy, uh, meaning that he engaged with a broad network of other people in an attempt to overturn the election. That's that's what I'm aware of on its face. Um, and 
I, I suppose what I find fascinating is that the prosecutor who uh, presented the evidence to two grand juries specializes in RICO cases. So my, my thought is uh, she looked at the statutes, she looked at the evidence as it was gathered, presented that to the grand jury, and they agree that there is a RICO case here to be tried. So uh, one of the things that I am pleased with in Georgia, we don't know how this is going to play out, but I'd like to believe that the trial will be televised, and I think that will make it much more meaningful for everyone uh, to to get to see those goings on in real time. You know, I, I think there's a lot of uh, value to that. I know mm-hmm. that back when we had court TV mm-hmm. um, and we had, you know, the cases in Florida with the uh, tragic case uh, of the, um, trying to remember the guy, Trevon Martin and Trevon the Martin. Um, George mm-hmm. Zimmerman, mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, watching that, I think, was a, a good thing. The um, case in Kenosha, being able to watch that, of course, the O.J. Mm-hmm. Simpson trial, mm-hmm. um, it let people, It I think it lowered the temperature mm-hmm. uh, because people didn't have to rely on a knowingly slanted reporting from one side versus the other. Yeah. So I, I, I would like to see that um, occur. Um mm-hmm. And, you know, Trump thinks everything's about him. So, you know, he thought the COVID briefings was about him. So apparently he's going to look at this as a reality TV show. Yeah. Um, here's my experience with, with Rico, by the way, it, it, for what it's worth. It's normally a trailing charge. OK, it's like we caught all these guys, you know, doing something, selling drugs, running guns, you know, whatever it might be. And they've been doing it for a long time. So we're going to lay layer Rico over the top of this thing. Mm-hmm. OK, it's not like one guy went out and did this. It was, you know, you and I set up an enter- a business enterprise to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, Barbara McQuaid, who is a um, a far left legal analyst on MSNBC. She's a, she lives here in Ann Arbor. She was on a local television station. Um, and she said the case in Georgia goes, it's not a slam dunk. OK, that. Uh, you know, that that th- this may or may this may re- result in acquittal or it may not. I don't know what she said on MSNBC, but mm-hmm. she gets paid differently there. Um, we, there's a rec- recall of the prosecutor, and I believe she pronounces her name Fonnie Willis. Um, Correct. That Georgia Senate Bill 92 says that conduct pred- prejudicial to the administration of justice, which brings the office into disrepute, you can bring up prosecutor back. And then the House subcommittee is investigating Fonnie Willis to see if she was influenced by anybody from D.C. Are these recalls good assurances that there's a clean process or more dirty politics or something else? I think it's playing politics. Um, Trump or anyone else, and he uses this very often, first of all, If anyone has what can be tracked as a history of uh, being a Democrat or a Republican, he will immediately use that as a means of attack. He'll say it's a uh, a lunatic far left Democrat who's uh, prosecuting me. It's a Democrat far left judge who's overseeing the case. So that has become part of the standard play. Any judge, any prosecutor has every right to embrace the political ideologies that they want to embrace and have embraced. And that can't be used against them just because the person who's being prosecuted or who's going on trial is of an opposite political party. But that's that's what seemingly is happening with much more frequency now. If, if you can prove that this person is... Um, not a Republican, and they're prosecuting you, or they are the judge who is to oversee your case. Attack them for that reason alone, and it's it's spiraling. We're seeing it more now than ever before. I think that, I think it's why. And, the two and I share your concern about. Spy- I think it's why the two investigations that you referenced 
uh, into Fonnie Willis. I think it's the only reason they exist. Yeah, well, what I you, you mentioned spiraling is that what happens when the shoe goes on the other foot? Okay, and it's a you know a Republican leaning prosecutor and a you know Democrat leading um, state house. Do they mm-hmm. then you know get in the middle of the judicial branch of the government? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I want to see a clean process. Is is what I I would like to see. And and look, there's been a history of election challenges, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that and I think this will be part of the defense. Uh, you know, leaving aside 2016 and Hillary Clinton, um, first of all, in 2012 and 2018 and 2008, you know, neither Romney nor McCain challenged. Uh, they were, you know, of course, gentlemen. Mm-hmm. Uh, 2004, I think you're, you know that uh, Senator Kerry, who lost the election, um, challenged in, in Ohio and talked about having a different slate of electors. Um, mm-hmm. They brought uh, lawsuits with that. I mean, he wasn't charged, mm-hmm. but he... he you know, said that the, you know, that he didn't think the election was run fairly. And of course we have 2000. Um, Can you imagine, you know, Al Gore was going out to concede when they told him, wait a minute, there's been voter intimidation in Florida. And we had all of that going around. And, you know, the, I think it was a 500 vote difference and Mm -hmm. it'd been recounted multiple times. Mm -hmm. Gore lost every undercourt. He, he won one thing in the Florida Supreme Court, and the chief justice said that they could not validate that decision based in uh, based by statute or by mm-hmm. precedent, mm-hmm. went to the Supreme Court, and they said, yeah, it's the circuit courts had voted right. And, of course, we've had recount after recount, and it turned out Bush won. Thank goodness. Mm-hmm. Not thank goodness that Bush was the president. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that. I'm saying thank goodness that we didn't have one of those recounts done that said, ah, we may we missed yep. it. You know, yeah, yep. like that. And of course, Al Gore went on to become a famed uh, climatologist. Yep. So all's well. I can appreciate his work. Uh, that needs to be taken much more seriously as uh, recent events in Hawaii have illustrated, recent events in Los Angeles have illustrated uh, a 109 degree temperature in Atlanta in the last week in August. When kids are back in school at football is, practice, is that hundred? Is, is your temperature is is that a heat index or is that a ambient temperature? The one yesterday on? in my car, the thermostat on my car read one hundred nine, so that would have been the actual temperature. Not a after you'd been driving for like, I mean, that's happened to me too. I you know, like I oh, used yeah, to live in the I've desert in the, in the winter. Car it was one hundred and seventeen yeah. when I, we didn't go there in the summer. Mm-hmm. It was one seventeen. It, and it would, I, it, I had actually been in the car f- for quite a bit, and uh, at a certain point, I just got fascinated because it just kept going up and up and up. So it was that was an ambient temperature then. That wow, that that, was. that's bad. And look, in, in Lahaina Town, um, the which I happen to know a lot about, the there's a lot of uh, former agricultural land that was left to to dry. They did not maintain the power grid. It, it was. Uh, the electric line starting, and then because of the pressure system from the hurricane, the high winds were blowing down the mountain mm-hmm. and spreading the fire, and they couldn't get the helicopters up to dump water. And you're talking about you know 200 year old wooden buildings. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it went running um, through through that. Um, so here we have now this. Uh, charges with Trump. What happens if he's acquitted? Uh, um, no, this is, this is, this is solely my opinion, but that's probably or possibly why you have me on the show today. I cannot. I, I, I love that. I want to hear from, not only do you have a great voice, you got a great mind behind it. So okay. yeah. well, what happens that. if he's acquitted? I, I appreciate that. Um, both counts. Uh, I personally have not envisioned a scenario, any scenario where he makes it through these four trials without a conviction in at least one of the four. And that's not to say that more that more aren't coming. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing that there's the potential 
that uh, a similar case in Arizona might be brought to the case here in Georgia, uh, all based on putting forth slates of fake electors. So I, I, there could be many more cases for him, uh, many more trials for him to face. But quite literally, Rich, I have not envisioned any scenario where he comes out clean right. from these four different well, trials, the existing four well, trials. Well, look, let me let me just tell you something not to do then, or maybe you need to do it, because I actually went back and I listened to the entire transcript Mm -hmm. uh, of the call that he had with um, Mr. Raffensperger. Raffensperger. Yeah. And of course, we have the media saying, I, I all I said was go find 11,788 votes, right? The whole world knows that, mm -hmm. um, that line. And, but when you go through the transcript, now, by the way, I believe Trump couldn't get his head, the same guy that said my inauguration crowd was bigger than Obama's. Mm -hmm. Couldn't get his head around the fact that he had lost to Joe Biden. Okay. Um, but he went through kind of chapter and verse about why he, you know, there's 300,000 ballots here, um, vacant addresses out of state, um, signatures that weren't matched to prior voting records, um, military ballots coming in, which was also mixed with State Department. So there was an explanation for that. And kind of when you look at it, if I'm thinking, if I was a juror, would I have a reasonable doubt? And based on that alone, now again, I haven't heard all of it, mm -hmm. I would say that nah, kind of sounds like a guy saying statistically in all of these things and based on our polling going in, we just got, there's got to be an error someplace. But here's the, the kill shot that kind of defeats that, um, that uh, in 2020, 28,000 Georgians skipped the presidential race, and yet they voted down balance in every other race. This is from Mr. Raffensperger. Okay. Republican congressmen ended up getting 33,000 more votes than President Trump. And that's why he came up short. And by the way, that happened to Hillary Clinton in Michigan in 2016. Mm -hmm. The Democrats wouldn't vote for her. Mm -hmm. Republicans in 2020 in Georgia weren't going to vote for Trump. Mm -hmm. And that was really the difference in the election. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 it's not as, it's not as it's being portrayed. Um, and that's why I would encourage all my readers, listeners, and viewers to, when they hear a conclusory statement, mm -hmm. get it's the facts, listen to the whole thing that might give them context. I'm not saying it would change necessarily what, mm -hmm. how they think, but at least mm -hmm. they have context. So you can't imagine that uh, he escapes at all, okay? And I and I think that the obstruction, that that's, I think it's probably going to get clipped on obstruction in one of these, mm -hmm. is my sense, mm -hmm. okay? That, that's that's my, my thing. Okay, now, what happens if he's found guilty? Then maybe the GOP can start the healing process? And maybe the country can start the, the healing process. Uh, a key part of his presence and the attention that he gets, the reason it's so troubling to me is it's just this ongoing spread of toxicity. It's just this ongoing, uh, it's, it's like he's just poisoning the air. He's angry. He spreads his anger. In my view, he's a bigot. He spreads his bigotry. Uh, he's a misogynist. He spreads his misogyny. I'm just ready to not have to hear or see his toxicity because I don't think it's, I mean, I think if he's incarcerated, uh, there's less a chance that we would have to see posts on truth social. You know, I don't know how all of that works, but I think there's much less a chance that we would continue to be uh, uh, subjected to his toxicity. And so I would love to see uh, the clearing of the air that comes with him being put away. That's the best way I know how to describe well, it. Well, think, think, think about those four voting blocks that he still has. The disciples, the people that still haven't had an answer to their populist urges, 
the uh, people that think that the judicial system, judicial system is being weaponized, and then the Democrats that cl- cross over to strategically vote for Trump. It seems to me three of those four groups aren't going to be happy on a um, uh, on a conviction unless it's both done convincingly and that there's further investigations into the Biden side of things. So I, I don't believe a, a conviction is a cleansing thing. And I'm curious is if you believe that maybe just getting beaten in an election is a better thing. You know, like why go through all this weak legal stuff when you could just put it, keep running the tape of what he was saying on January 6th, you know, put the tape of his petulant self, not going to, you know, his airplane taking off versus welcoming the incoming president, you know, uh, take those, you know, uh, racist or misogynist statements and keep putting those into a campaign. Um, I don't understand all the time, money, effort being put in to to this stuff. I mean, I want my president to be not a criminal. I want mm-hmm. them to be a people of integrity, mm-hmm. whoever the president might be. But, you know, the risk is, you know, there's a quote, and I don't, you probably know it better than I do about if you shoot at a king, you better kill him. Yeah, and this is what I, I I have a real I have a real fear, you know, like what would the the Democratic left and all the people that were rioting in 2020 say if Trump's acquitted? You think they're going to go? Ah, my bad. I, I'm sorry. I guess he really didn't do anything. Uh, it's <laughs> that's a daunting one to try to answer. Uh, first of all, I. I'll I'll start to sound repetitive now Um, of the four trials that he's facing. I think he'll be convicted in at least one. I see him being convicted uh, possibly in two, the, the January 6th trial and the Georgia uh, Rico charge. I I see convictions there. Um, If he's not, Okay, I, that's what I'm saying. Let's play that. We don't know. It's, 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 we, you know, I had a column that I wrote. It said yeah. he's either going to be indicted or not indicted, yeah. convicted or not convicted. So now we've already gotten through that gate. He's been indicted. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying, okay, if he, let's just play this out because we don't know. If he gets acquitted, what's going to happen in the country? Okay. And I know this is a horrifying thing to think of, but that man's mm-hmm. ego mm-hmm. and that man's microphone if he, you know, beats the rap 100% down the line, what happens then? Where are we as a country? I think, no, this is this is where my mind goes next. I don't know that, I, I can't speak for anyone else, but this is where my mind goes next. So far, anything and everything he has said since the indictments have been handed down has been about... Uh, it being a witch hunt, uh, prosecutor, prosec- prosecutorial misconduct, uh, election mm-hmm. interference. We have heard absolutely nothing from Mr. Trump regarding what his next term would be seeking to accomplish. We've not heard any reference to. <laughs> yeah, well, right. It, 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 and I, so I, think, I am in a hundred. I'm in a hundred. Look, I'm in a hundred percent agreement with you. Yeah. So I, I think he, ha- what he has that- he has no game as a president. OK, and I'm so just trying to say is that people have you know, to come to that realization. He's a, he's acquitted. Mm-hmm. He's acquitted doesn't make him president. Let's just mm-hmm. say he's acquitted. And in fact, let me ask, here's three questions. OK, what happens if he's acquitted? What happens is he, if he's found guilty? And what do you think the Republicans are going to do to the Democrats at the first time they get the chance? If he's found guilty, and you and I possibly are probably split split because I I think I went down this road just briefly a few moments ago, I think the healing process can begin. I think not being subjected to his ongoing toxicity 
allows for that that healing to start. Okay, but again, that's with the presupposing that there are people that think it's been a fair process and it's a and it's a just decision. Okay, because I agree with you. In a if 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 the populace can be convinced that yeah, you know what bad guy we've heard that by the way that's why i would like the trial being televised everything mm-hmm. we heard on the trial yep this guy needs to be punished mm-hmm. okay and let's just leave out whether it's house arrest or he's incarceration someplace else mm-hmm. i know no one the, else the, where i see the risk is that people don't feel like at as of today the country is not united in the idea that these are going to be fair trials. Okay. There are people that have already convicted them. There's people that have already acquitted them. There's people that have, are saying it doesn't look good. And there's people that say it looks good. Let's see what comes out. Mm-hmm. We're, we're going to remain divided. I don't believe that an acquittal or a, or a conviction does anything for uniting it. Okay. If he's convicted, it's going to have to be convincing a lot of people. If he's acquitted, it's going to have to have people, perhaps like you, would you, could you ever imagine yourself saying it was a fair trial and he was found not guilty? I, I wrestle with the question of will there be that jury out there that where 12 people can agree? And, and yeah, that's, it's, it's a tough question. I believe I believe oh, yeah. the trial would be I believe the trial would be fair. I think the evidence is going to be laid out um, in an in an ideal world, the absolute best case scenario for me is when he decides to represent himself. <laughs> I say bring it on. <laughs> well, well, he, he is running out of lawyers, but Absolutely. you know, you brought up you brought up another conundrum too. Uh, what if He's uh, acquitted uh, uh, ten to two. Okay, something like that. I don't. I don't even know if these yeah. are jury trials yeah. or bench trials or what. Yeah. But yeah, what happens if if he's acquitted ten to two? Yeah, and this it, is this is and tough. this is my concern. That and then so and again, let me just the second to the last question, Thomas. And by the way, you've been a great guest. I I think we're gonna have two episodes out of this. Um, <laughs> what do you think the Republicans are going to do? when they get the chance, because my, I have a philosophy that says this, based on my life experience, the person that starts a fist fight, a lawsuit or a war, mm-hmm. rarely is the person that gets to decide when and how it ends. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the GOP is going to punch back. It's coming. If they regain power, Rich, I honestly believe that they're... <laughs> I don't. I, I hate to use terms like they, them. Uh, granted, the country is divided. I think the GOP uh, is coming down on the wrong side of history on a number of issues that um, Middle America is is pretty set on. Um, I think women want the right to decide. Uh, to make choices with their doctors on control of their bodies. I think the Republicans are on the ones on the wrong side of that. I think most Americans want common sense gun reform. I think Republicans are on the wrong side of that. I think everyone, well, I think most reasonable, prudent people uh, want some kind of acknowledgement of climate change to be able to take practical steps to address it. And, This might sound insignificant, but I get completely enraged when I hear uh, Mr. Trump referencing that he would pardon those who participated in the January 6th riot. He said there were some, I believe he used the term, I think he said there were a couple of people who got violent. But I, I just think the GOP knows that it's unpopular. It's, so you you don't think all right? So your answer to this, would the GOP do something? You're saying they're never going to get in power. Um, I hope you I watch the debate because there is a consensus forming. There, there is a consensus forming around the abortion issue. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, the Republicans are way ahead about the border and immigration. 
Um, mm-hmm. The Republicans are ahead on the economy. The Republicans are hugely ahead on censoring. Um, so uh, th- there's, and this is a Republican in general, not Donald Trump. Okay, mm-hmm. Donald Trump's not even a real Republican. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- there are, uh, you know, they're good people that could run a government. I'm not saying they're going to be your favorite candidate, but if you watch that debate, you saw there were, you know, five or six of them that, yeah, they, these guys are executives. They know how to run a government. I um, saw two adults but, in the room that night. Uh, the two adults in the room that night for me were Chris Christie and Nikki Haley. A lot of other folks right, that yeah, just saw cool. I, uh, a lot of folks, other folks for me were just jockeying and <laughs> trying to score, uh, you know, a few punchlines. But uh, Christie and Haley yeah, for me. Right. And, and again, they, they, you know, look, I, I wouldn't expect by, by way of example, you would agree on very many policy positions with Mike Pence. But he, he's a he. There's no question he's a capable guy. He's been mm-hmm. a, a vice president, a governor, and a mm-hmm. representative, mm-hmm. and he's not an idiot. And he, you know, he stood up for the Constitution when he his very life was being threatened. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I, I can't imagine you getting behind him policy wise, but you know, okay, he's, he's a capable guy. Okay. Um, and, and so are some of the others. And you know, Nikki Haley. Um, I, I happen to have been following her since her first run for governor um she's a high quality individual mm-hmm. and you know and has handled some tough things think she'd make a great president mm-hmm. uh, now the question is is the process going to let us get there um where you know are we going to get served up uh, another biden and trump uh thing which three quarters of americans don't want mm-hmm. um but thomas this has been a great chat with you my <laughs> friend and uh, i dearly appreciate you coming on and you're like one of the most reasoned and measured human beings I know. Uh, and I, and I do appreciate that you're willing to sit down and chat. Um, well, I appreciate, and, I, I appreciate the time. Um, uh, and sometimes, good. you know, I have to take that with all my guests, I have to, because of a nonpartisan view of this show, I have to say, well, what about this? What about, you know, the, this is the other side of this thing. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, one of the things that perhaps you and I could come together on, um, would be to have a discussion. Maybe we invite some other folks about what happens it, under acquittal. What happens under if he's found guilty? Okay. Because I don't see a path out of this mess right now. You know, there's there, there it. I, I wish if these if there's going to be a conviction, I hope it's clear and convincing and mm-hmm. enough to have people go, yeah, I'm, mm-hmm. I, you know, he, he did all that. Um, and if he's acquitted. I, I hope people would go, yeah, you know, I kind of got, I got excited about the Russian conclusion. I got mm-hmm. excited about the P tape. Mm-hmm. I, I got tricked. Um, mm-hmm. You know, my bad. I'm not going to listen to those news programs anymore that got me so excited. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that would be a great outcome, but remains to be seen. I you think- have the last word, my friend. What didn't we talk about that you'd like to make mention to the <laughs> audience of the common bridge? Um, our, readers at Substack, our listeners at Substack and of podcast outlets every place, uh, and our viewers on Substack and a few of them on YouTube as well. So uh, I would you know 100,000 plus people are going to see this and hear this. <laughs> I would just share with your, uh, uh, your, your audience that uh, Rich and I have a history that I worked for not one, but two firms that he has uh, founded and presided over, uh, first being Superior Consultant Holdings Corporation, uh, and then much more recently, Santa Rosa Consulting. So uh, in my three decades of IT consulting, I've had the pleasure of uh, working for uh, two of those companies and have had the pleasure to have uh, good dialogues like this one uh, with Rich, where we go into the discussions knowing that we're not always going to agree in fact, knowing that we're in all likelihood going to disagree more than we agree, but uh, always fascinating dialogues. And I certainly appreciate uh, today to have this time to share my thoughts with you and your 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 guests. Great. And, and based on that sentiment, I'll take the final, final word. And uh, in the thousands of people uh, that, you know, were members of our companies over the years, um, you know, a few stand out and Thomas, you're one of those guys. 
And I think this hopefully is an example that friends and colleagues can think about things differently, uh, but we can all want the same thing for a better future. Absolutely. Um, and with our guest, Thomas Hicks, um, voter uh, in Atlanta, voter in the state of Georgia. A I just lost man. connection, Rich. Uh, Rich. This is Rich Helpy signing off on The Common Bridge. Thanks for joining us on The Common Bridge. Subscribe to The Common Bridge on Substack.com or use their Substack app where you can find more interviews, columns, videos, and nonpartisan discussions of the day. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can also find The Common Bridge on Mission Control Radio on your Radio Garden app.